ladder. Sounds so linear, right? So steep, you just go up. And when I saw this gift, I was like, that's how it's felt so many times because it feels like you keep on going and going and you're not necessarily going anywhere. And then I started thinking, sometimes I feel like life is Tetris. You feel like everything is falling into place. You feel like you're getting there, you feel your, your trajectory is right on the spot. And then you're feeling like everything, you have the last piece that's gonna come, let make everything together. So maybe that's how you're thinking about your product career. And then at the end, something happens and it's not put together and it doesn't work and you have to figure it out. So that's the core of the life of a product manager. Always figure out, always, not just solutions for a company, figure out your career. You're also designing a career. So that's why I changed my title to the bumpy PM career ladder because it's not linear, it's not easy, it's not hard, it's just unexpected. And I want you to think of it like that because it, it will make your life easier not to think like, I didn't get that PM, PM role. That's fine, because you can end up being, I don't know, maybe you're a designer, you can become a senior UX designer, and then you move, you move to a PM. It's never, like, if something doesn't happen right after this, like, as you're applying to a position or something like that, it's not the end of the world. And you can design your career as much as you design products. So, who am I? Because every presentation begins with a who am I, and I thought, why not add in this cute little baby here? So in the existential world, there's so many things that I would like to share about who am I, but I'm gonna distill it to a few points that might be helpful to get context of where I'm coming from. 16 years total experience, so I've been around <laughs> for a while, and 11 years as a PM. So I started in 2008, back when PM was still a very confusing function, um, which I think has also helped me because there was much more flexibility there was less strict, you need to have done product for this amount of time. Um, but then there was also a lot of like, what, what the hell am I supposed to do tomorrow? And um, I think that after 11 years, I have a better idea of that. Um, 10 years of mostly startup experience, which, I, which was really funny because I think it happened accidentally. I graduated in 2009 and I thought I was gonna go to a big corporation. I actually had entered at Expedia, and uh, this was the summer of 2008, and that was my first uh, product role. And then 2009 was the worst possible time to graduate from an MBA because there were no jobs. While my school usually has around 70% of people um, that graduate already with an offer, we graduated, I think, 30% of us having jobs, and well, actually I was on the other 70 that didn't have jobs. But that was an interesting summer, but it enabled me to think more open-minded about, okay, I need to get a job, I need to get experience, maybe I'm not gonna get the salary that I was aiming for, but I was able to enter a startup in which I could continue growing my um, experience. I worked on travel. Uh, I started my career at Nerline, and then I also worked at Expedia, and I worked on a few other OTAs right afterwards. Um, I've also worked on real estate, so um, I started in San Francisco working for Trulia, which is the equivalent to Zoopla here. Eventually Trulia was acquired by Zillow, and then Zillow is a massive real estate uh, company. They were our competitors. So glad I was not there through acquisition because I hated them as competitors. <laughs> um, I've been in fintech, so I, I did my, my fintech test here in London. I worked at Nutmeg right before not, uh, working at her. Um, I've been in fintech, as I said, I worked at Nutmeg. Uh, I learned my fair share of compliance and uh, how to get through that. And marketplaces, I, I think that truly is a marketplace. What I'm doing right now at Verve is a marketplace as well, and I'm doing travel at Verve. So it's an interesting mix of industries. Um, from a region perspective, I worked in the US. Well, I'm originally from El Salvador, so I've worked in Central America. US, Europe, and now in the UK. I'm a Stanford MBA for what it's worth. I think it was a great education, but we're gonna talk about MBAs right afterwards. 
and I'm, I'm a happy wife and I'm a happy mom. And I think part of also the, the product career is about enjoying yourself. If it's not something that you're enjoying, because it's hard work, I'm not gonna lie, it's hard work. Sometimes not appreciated work. Um, I think the reason why there's so many people passionate about product is because you feel quite capable of making change in the world. Uh, but it's a lot of hard work, so it's good to have a support network on my side. Good, so what do we have for today? Three, as I was reflecting on the slide that um, Tony, 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 Tony. <laughs> was sharing at the beginning, I'm sort of organizing my talk like that. It's how do you get into product management? How do you grow as a product manager? And then how do you become a product leader? Um, so sounds like your courses are organized like that. So we're going to leave Q&A uh, for, for, the, for the end. Transitioning into product. So I have some tips of what you should consider. Know what you're signing up for and be careful what you wish for. Because in reality, so many people can say, what do you do? Like, you want to know what product is about. Like, you need to learn about all of these because A, it gets you better prepared for an interview. But it's also, it sets your expectations, right? So that you're not disappointed, so you, that, that you don't think, okay, this is not a very glamorous role as I thought it would be. Um, there's many books that have helped me shape my career. I'm a big Marty Kagan fan. Does anyone, does anyone know here or know, knows him? Please read his book, because it gives you so many insights on what are the critical roles, how to work with stakeholders, how to work with engineers, um, he also has a great blog, so I declare myself as a group groupie uh, to Marty Gain. The Lean Product Playbook, which is by uh, Dan Olson as well, I like following the line of the Lean Startup. And then Hook, that is one that I really enjoy because it helps you understand how to build uh, for something that's sticky. Network, network, network. You're probably already doing this, but some of the opportunities, this is how they happen. Through your network, through the person that you spoke at at the, at the last event. Granted, I don't love networking, but I found myself that when I do it, it has worked out. And work on side projects that can help you build your skills. So if you're prepared, like, say that you're right out of university, you need to have some evidence that you can do the work, engage in a project right after university, or you know, volunteer for um, a co-founder. Like, there's so many people that are needing talent, so you definitely can uh, look for an opportunity just to build their, your skills, which I think is going to then start making you think, okay, so where do I want to take it from here? I think it's necessary to make sure that you tick some boxes. So there's a huge list of skills. Like as you read blogs and as you read books and so on, like they tell you about analytic skills, they tell you about customer centric skills, they tell you about like how you do experimentation. And I think I want to share two stories with you. The first one is how do I got myself into Expedia? So I did not know anything about product back in 2008. However, as I was going, as I was go, going through my MBA at Stanford, <coughs> it's inevitable to get contained, to get like just so into the tech wave that I started listening to this product manager role. I wasn't going to be an engineer because if I was going to get an MBA, that would not have made that much sense. But I wanted to understand more. How can I be part of a Google, be part of a Facebook, which were all the hype. And then, as I was thinking about product management, many internships didn't happen because I didn't have the previous background. Now, I did have the industry background, and that's what I saw. So one of the feedback that I received when I, you know, I was given the offer is that I had shown in my role within the airline that I had done similar challenges of those that, to those that I was going to face at Expedia. And that's what opened the door. So make sure that at least Take the industry box, because at least you can understand the business, the competitors, uh, the market trends, and so on, and that at least gives you some overlap with the position. Alternatively, I was 
this was post business school at an e-commerce company and it didn't work out from a cultural fit perspective so then I went to interview at Trulia and my manager who has been such a great mentor uh, during my career my manager took a very pragmatic approach and kudos to him because not too many people tend to do this I didn't have the product manager title but he started asking me have you worked with engineers yes have you worked with designers yes have you done AB tests yes have you done um, you know whatever, the design sprint, no. But I ticked a lot of the boxes, and even when you don't have the title, look deeper into the job, right, to understand maybe I'm already doing some of these things, and I'm going to start listing the examples, and I'm gonna convince you that even if I haven't had the title, I can do at least 50% of what you're saying in your job description. And then, it's also about choosing the right company stage. Are you aiming for Facebook? Facebook has so much competition in terms of the cat. Of course, they're hiring a lot here in London, but there's so much competition to get a role at Facebook. In Facebook, it's an already established um, company, so it's established enough that they have the luxury to select from a, very, from a great pool of people. So within the pros and cons, and I'm gonna start here, of course you're going to learn a lot, of course you're going to have a more stable uh, salary, but the problem here is that you need to, to have the exact experience to apply. So back to the tick boxes, in this one probably you need to tick around 95%. So the scale-ups, uh, which are the ones that have already proven that you know they have found the product market fit, it's mainly about growth right now, around 100 people. It, this is, of course, not necessarily black and white, but these are, uh, these are companies that you can see the product resonates with you and that they're investing in hiring more people to actually grow. From here, you can get, of course, a lot of uh, experience, but also they're hiring as well leaders that you can learn from. So I, I put Verve there. I think that there have been a lot of investing, investing in bringing the leadership layers so that we can help uh, hire more PMs, more engineers, and so on. And in fact, I'm hiring senior PMs. So uh, let's see if we could be good, good candidates. Depending on the company, and so this is a, a big um, question, but some of them, they can pay good salaries as well. So it, like, I wouldn't write it off just because it's a brand that you don't know that much and so on. Because, for example, we keep an eye on the, the trends for salaries and so on. We have a policy of pay transparency. So we do pay attention to how salary impacts the level of talent that you can recruit. Now, the con here is you need to have some experience to apply. Back on the tick boxes, um, framework, I would say you probably need to be at a 70-75% this. But I think that there's still some flexibility and if you can prove that you have a project that can you know, match uh, the role that you're uh, applying for, then I think that there's the open conversation to have. But make sure, it's like I receive so many resumes with no context without, without me like, actually able to understand so why did you apply for this role? Um, so make sure that you're reflecting that. Like some platforms don't even have the ability for you to submit a, a cover letter. So reflect it somewhere in your resume why your experience can be applied to this role. And I guess pre-product market fit, like a very early stage uh, startup, they're way more open to consider a non-product background. And you're gonna get to wear many hats. So therefore you're gonna learn about product, about marketing, about even HR, because you might need to hire a facilities manager. Now the cons is like, it's a risky investment because it's an early stage company. You never know when they're gonna run out of cash and they have to close shop. Um, it's probably, they're probably the compensation is gonna be less about cash and way more about equity. And you're gonna have to wear many hats, which, so it's not black and white, right? Like the wearing many hats, it always, it's probably, it's, in an area that you're not interested in. And it's going to be, you know, in a, you might need to do some data entry. You might need to uh, do guerrilla testing of your mocks because you don't even have the 
the budget to pay for a ten, ten quid Amazon card. Um, yeah, so because we are kind of starters here, right? So um, the most probable that if we will actually start our career in product management, we will kind of get into the first or the second group if we are lucky. Why? Um, I don't know, depends what kind of how much we learned before. So let's say that I have I don't have a title and I checked some boxes but not many. Mm -hmm. Um so like we are speaking about this first group that you can learn a lot, but the problem is that you don't have anyone to learn from sometimes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you're on your own and in I don't know if you had such situations, so how do you structure this knowledge basically? How do you, from which sources you learn? Because you need to do so many things, so you don't know many of those, and you don't have a leader to kind yeah. of guide you, right? Yeah, and you don't always are going to have the leader or mentor within your company, right? Like, you have to realize maybe this is a CEO that is fully technical. So he's actually hiring someone to help him figure out what to do in product. Um, the good thing is that there's so many materials for you to read, but then a lot of it, same as with any other product, is going to be you have to test. You have to keep on testing and testing with your own day to day to see what resonates. I think no one, no one taught me how to be a product manager. No, like even at Expedia, I had to figure it out myself, and I had. You know, a boss that was amazing, but I had to figure out myself because thinking about the challenge at Expedia, it was 10 weeks. So what am I supposed to do within these 10 weeks? Then you have to learn about the culture of the company, how do you get things done, and so on. So don't, well, it is, I guess, a disadvantage that you're not learning from someone. It also has their advantages in other sites, and then there are also other sources, like, you know, you can always Again, and this is by no means just trying to push product school, but like there are multiple ways that you can learn more about the key concepts of a product manager that can help you. And I think like if this is the path that you want to select, or if this is the path that you think is going to be more likely uh, for you to follow, um, I would also challenge that because like, like the, the takeaway from this shouldn't be. And, and I hope that that's not the understanding that you have to start from here. It's like, you can probably start from here, but you're going to, what's your career uh, path right now, your title? I've been in customer service, now I'm in sales team. So, for example, at that point, we promoted a customer service representative to be a product man. Why? Because he, he knew everything about the customer. So it's also about being part of a company that can recognize those opportunities as well. And it might not be the right company and maybe you need to move uh, to a different company as well. But you can start at a customer service, uh, say, back to the Facebook, and then you can network internally so that you can become a product manager. I'm going to carry on. Um, so growing as a PM, some of you are already PMs. I found this framework really helpful. Um, it balances two dimensions. What is the impact that you're having to the organization? And what is the scope of your role? So say that your scope can be small, a very small set of features. Your scope can be medium. You're looking you know, at the retention space of your product. Or you can have a very large scope. You're in charge of the whole product of, of the company. And actually, this is, I borrowed from Shreyas Doshi. He has a very interesting talk on this. He's a PM at Stripe, but a PM sounds like as if he was very junior. The reality is that he's been doing product for probably a little bit longer than I have. So he has decided himself to now be an individual contributor, even after testing uh, being a product leader. So back to the point that it's never linear, um, and it's wherever you see your skills can fit within our, an organization. And then your impact within the, the business can be low or it can be high. So the way that he organizes this is like you start as an associate PM, uh, as you have a small scope and low impact of what you do, 
But then when the impact of what you do, you have proven that you can bring in 3,000 new customers because of a new feature that you didn't know it was going to end up in that, then that's how you can get into a promotion, PM, PM1. Then they give you more challenges, your scope grows, and then you can grow into a PM2. So there's different levels of PM, even like before getting to the senior level. And then again, you prove yourself, you know that you're bringing much more value to the company, you're promoted to senior PM, and so on, until you get to a director level because you have a lot of impact within the organization. Sounds really breezy, sounds like, again, very linear, and sounds really good. My trajectory, and back to the point that <laughs> it's not necessarily very straightforward, I started as a strategic analyst, and I put this within my product management career because I think it actually started me. Um, what are the skills that I gained there? I gained analytics, I gained a customer because I had to, I did a lot of uh, customer interviews. Um, I was helping the customer service team to cut costs. So for example, I was doing interviews on the food service, and could we cut down costs there? Should we go to another provider? So I believe that a lot of what I learned, even when I was a strategic analyst, uh, I was able to leverage in my next role. And also, back to the industry, I was already part of the travel industry. So which was the next role? It was, I, also, I was given a tech um, implementation project while I was a strategic analyst. This was uh, Lufthansa Systems, which is the tech side of Lufthansa. They were our provider for crew management, uh, for a crew management system within the airline. So from them, I had to, like, they were my, um, I, were, I was their client, they were sort of my product manager. So from them, I had to give them a lot of the requirements, I had to do the user testing, I had to, like, figure, it, figure out if the data was going to go well and so on. So, I believe that like, even when I didn't see it very clearly, then this was my first tech project that I uh, got engaged in. And then all of those stories allowed me to become a PM intern at Expedia. So again, it was 10 weeks. I thought I was going to have a, a job right after graduation. Then I think that they, they went on a um, hiring freeze probably in February and I was going to graduate in June, so I didn't have any jobs. But I think that that's what opened up my mind to startups. And what I found is within the network of my school, I was able to reach out to the founders coming from Stanford as well. So the founder of Tiny Prince, which was a company very similar to Moonpig, actually, and that was acquired afterwards by uh, Shutterfly. The founder was the one that gave me a chance. And then I started my role as a site manager, which I have never seen this role title somewhere else. Uh, but my role was about in, in, a, in a place in which we didn't have a good um, CMS. And um, we had so many landing pages because we needed to build SEO value. I was the one creating multiple landing pages, working with designers, working with a, a photographer, working with a developer, and so on, putting together all of those landing pages. Um, and I was a site manager in charge of actual like money. I was in charge of a number of uh, millions of revenue that needed to come from my landing pages. And and this is when I made the jump to Trulia, and that's where my manager did that exercise that I told you about, about the, the tape off. So I don't think I was here just because I think that this gap may have been filled by the MBA. Because that, that was a step up into probably getting to more senior, um, getting considered to more, for more senior positions right at their business school. Because you, it gives you another credential, if that makes sense. Um, and then, within Trulia, I was a PM, promoted to a senior PM. My scope increased because I was in charge of the retention of my customer. So instead of just focusing on a few cheap features, I was focusing on retention, which was a critical um, metric because as we were going to IPO, 
we needed to prove that we had a good retention path. I was able to prove that all of these uh, things that I was going to work on were going to provide value for the company, my scope in increased. And I was not only a senior PM, but I was also coordinating um, retention initiatives throughout the company, working with marketing, working with sales, working with as many stakeholders as possible so that we had cross-functional retention initiatives. So my scope significantly increased. And then after that, I was promoted to director of PM at Trulia. Then I joined another OTA in Barcelona as a group director. And then I decided to move to London. And I had to take a hit. So back to the point that it's never linear, I had to go to from director to senior PM. Because you need to make trade-offs sometimes. I was going into a new market and also into a new industry. So it's coming from travel, marketplaces, e-commerce, going into fintech, which investment I didn't have that much clue on. Um, and I also, my, my manager as well, which was an amazing manager, wanted to keep the organization flat. But I wanted to enter into fintech, and I also wanted to enter into London, and that's where you have to make the trade-offs. But it's perfectly fine because you prove yourself in the end, what you have to prove is that you have the skills. So after a few months, they promoted me to head of product at Nutmeg. It also happened that there was a reorg, but those are also opportunities when they happen. Um, and now I'm VP of product at Verve. Yeah. Yeah, I put a question on your MBA. On oh, my MBA, yeah. Did you, um, beyond just the badge, was there anything that you took away from, from your MBA that really helped you with your, yeah. um, your career as a PM? So the question is, beyond my badge, beyond my certificate, what did I get out of my MBA? I had had a previous, so my career, my uh, bachelor, I did it on uh, economics and business. So I already had the basics. Um, funny enough, I think the first year was very repetitive. The second year, which was the elective year, that's, that's when I was able to learn so much about tech. So I chose the electives that were going to be associated with how can I move into tech. So from an education perspective, I would say that my second year was the one that brought me the most value. But in the end, and this is another consideration for an MBA, it's about the network that you get out of the MBA. I would say, Tiny Prince I got out of the network. Truly I got out of the network. He dreams. In Barcelona, I also got out of the network. Definitely not me. And I think that Ver has been the most, the, which is the most recent one, I didn't, and I had to apply myself. So it also depends on how strong the network of the MBA is. The alumni, there, sometimes there are alumni networks that are not as big, but they're very tight because they're not very big. And therefore, they're super helpful with the, with the graduates of those networks. Yeah? And thanks for taking your time to share your experience. Um, so I've got a question about how consistent have you found the title you've had with regards to the role and responsibility? So if you're looking after a particular vertical, do you find that you know in one company it's the same as what another person would be the same? The, the, the role, role of product, it's so variable across companies. It was more variable when I started though, right? I think that right now, there seems to be a trend of trying to make things more consistent because it also helps the people that have to hire, hire good talent. Because you cannot, there's just so much blurriness you can provide to someone that's starting a role uh, without that person feeling initially very nervous about what they're going to be doing. Um, but I think, back to the stages, it varies significantly. So I guess also at this advantage of the established companies is that you own a button, right? Like you don't own an experience. You don't own, like I did at Trulia, a retent. You don't own a problem or a mission. Um, the way that we were organized at Trulia was interesting because it was a funnel of engagement, conversion, and retention. Uh, it was not optimal because someone that would bring in a free customer through the engagement features was not in charge of them converting into successful customers and was not in charge of making them successful enough for them to retain, to, to continue. 
So I don't think that that organization was necessarily great, but also it allowed us to focus a lot. So I guess back to your question on, have I seen a lot of variation? Yes. Uh, and therefore, I think that the job description not always gives you the exact picture. You have to use the interview process to dig deeper, to understand what your KPIs are going to be, what your engineering team is going to look like. Are you going to have back end and front end, or you're only going to work potentially with an agency? So all of those questions are important when, because they impact the scope that you're going to have. Also, reporting lines. Who do you report into um, matters, right? Because if you're reporting, I have been in roles reporting into CPO, reporting into CMO, and now reporting into CTO. And those are then very different paths within a, within a company. So takeaways. Your dream as a PM may have already started. I think that those are good news. I hope you can get that takeaway from this. You, your product career might have already started. Think about how you're ticking the boxes. And the, gro the growth opportunities within your company are not always apparent. So back to the su su suggestion to network, you also need to network within your company. And that was something that I, had, that I, had, I have had to learn, probably through very tough stories in which I thought, you know, I'm a strong believer in meritocracy, and like if I work hard, I'm gonna be you know, promoted, no. No, that doesn't always happen. So sell yourself, network, bring in your, your network of fans so that they can advocate um, for you and for your growth within the company. And stay long enough. What happens a lot is that after two years of not seeing anything, you're like, I'm done, they're not recognizing me here. Stay a little bit long enough because you don't know if they're going to change management. You don't know if they're going to bring in another round of funding. You don't know if probably your boss is going to leave. So you, you can always be waiting for these opportunities, right? But like, try to always be mindful of everything that's going on. Because I think if you stay enough, you do have much more of the, like I would put myself in a position in which I would ask, that person already knows the piece. The, back to the customer service representative. That customer already. That person already knows the issues that our customers face. That person already knows that we're having. I don't know how many calls because of this particular issue. Maybe they don't know enough about how to work with an engineer, but you know what? I'm willing to put in the work because they already have a lot of the knowledge. So those are decisions that a hiring manager needs to face. And you always then need to be pitching for yourself. If you ever want to move into a new country or a different industry, you're going to have to take a hit. Or maybe you're not going to have to, but be prepared for it. Be open to it. And take, how many of you have heard about the growth mindset? So take it as an opportunity for you to learn, to grow. Like You are actually learning how to be successful in a new industry, which you might not have any clue about. I have, I have to read so many books um, when I enter Nutmeg, because I have zero clue. And I'm lucky that my husband, he works in the city, because he gave me some, I guess, buzzwords <laughs> to give into my interview. But I, need to, I needed to learn. I needed to learn from like, the actual concepts that I was going to work on. And the path is not linear. But I think I've said that enough. Becoming a product leader. You don't need to be a product leader. You don't need to have the title to actually be, to actually be a product leader. So one of the, the things that like people, people like to be asked for help, and people like to help. So if you want to grow as a leader, one of the easy things to do is to start offering your help to people that have never heard about Agile, have never heard about a design sprint, have never heard about, oh, let's ideate, like, they, like finance, HR, sales, they, they don't think on those terms. And this is where you can provide a lot of help to these people. So then back again, you're helping them, but you're also networking. And you can mentor people as well in other functions. 
If you make their lives easier, then they become your advocates. And it's also not just about being asked to be a mentor. Like, it's so awkward, to be honest, to receive the question of like, can I be your mentee? Like, it, it's such an awkward conversation. So I think it's about then, you know, just offering help. And I think that it just happens more naturally as a conversation. The second uh, idea that I have here is to go beyond your scope. So there's a framework, I don't know if you've heard about the, um, the Stephen Covey's Seven Habits, really old book, but really good one. <laughs> it talks about how sometimes you feel so defeated because there, your circle of control is so small and you don't feel like you can do much that what's in with, within your circle of control. So this is your circle of control and this is your circle of concerns, all of the things that are in your mind and you would like to change and so on. But that's because you don't consider that you, you can influence what's outside of your circle of control. So, for example, back to that sales guy that you help him make a spreadsheet much more efficient because they were hard coding data and so on. Maybe that person can now help you get an intro to a potential client so that you can learn more about how your product is affecting them or not. So engage on important projects within your company, even if they haven't been fully assigned to you, you can always say, oh, can I be added to the meeting so that I can learn more about it? And as you start learning more about things, start contributing to that. Because I think then that's when people start seeing that, oh, this person is hunger enough that they want to learn beyond what's already assigned to them. And think product with a capital P. That's something that we talk a lot about at Verb. Product is not just the, the package of tech software. Product goes beyond that. Product is how you sell it. Product is how you market it. Product is how you serve it. Product is how you package it. And all of that, a good PM has to at least be aware of what are the right choices in all of those areas for their product to be successful. Increase your commercial knowledge. So back to the MBA question. I already had commercial knowledge, and it wasn't hard for me to learn about KPIs and metrics and revenue and so on. But if that's not your forte, spend time learning about that. Because then you're not just building features, you're not just building, you know, uh, this button has, ha has to look like this. And you're, you're actually solving real business problems. And if you frame things like that, then it's easier to convince other people to, uh, to work with you, to prioritize projects that you, you might not be able to prioritize because you're saying, I need to build a new page. That means nothing to someone that is thinking about how much money is going, this going to bring to the business. So be commercially savvy that you can translate what your work contributes to the business. And good people to partner up with this are people that are, for example, in business intelligence or financial analysts that are taking a look at the performance of the business because those people, like not too many people actually <laughs> come to chat with them. And I think that they have a lot of information on how do the different drivers translate actually into revenue, into profit. And I think that they will be happy to spend some time teaching you. So back to the MBA. I don't think an MBA is required, by, by no means. Uh, back to my trajectory, it did help me. It would be very unfair to say what it did help me. But I have also, like for example, there's a person that I hired at Trulia. Uh, he applied to his MBA. It didn't work out. He's now a, found, a founder, and he's doing that full time. And he started his own business. And he came from Excel Partners, which is a huge uh, VC uh, company. So his trajectory has always has also been quite curious and the reality is like he's successful as, as he is. So don't take it as a requirement. Think carefully about the money that you're gonna put in. Investigate about the network. Investigate about the classes. If there are classes, professors um, that you're interested in, then that might make it work. But don't do it just because it sounds great. And then be explicit about your intentions. If you don't say it, it's not gonna happen. 
My manager at Trulia, he was promoted. So when I joined, he was director of product. Then he was promoted to VP of product. And then there was no director in between. I was a senior PM. I mentioned it to him. I mentioned it to the VP of sales. And I mentioned it to other people that I wanted to be considered for a director of product role. What was it, what was it going to take? You have to be explicit. And granted that I'm, I don't think I'm the the greatest at, uh, I don't know, self-promotion, but you have to establish what your goals are. And I think it's important to put it out there because you never know who's going to hear and who's going to influence others to make this happen. I think that's it. Time, time for QA. Do know what's the definition of product management? But I want to ask because bro, my background in digital marketing and working with technology and so on, I I feel I can develop some project management skills, but also there were some product management. But I'm not sure if there is connection with project management and if someone in project management can go to product management. And yeah. So if you're a full, if you if you have focused mainly on marketing, I think I don't know if you've heard about the four P's yeah. of marketing, which yeah. is what like price, promotion, placement, and product. So I think that within the product, the things that you have to consider are who is your customer, what need you're fulfilling to them, and when I talk about product management, I actually in this scenario mean about software as the product. Um, sometimes like it could be WeWork and then that product is also a physical product. It could be a hardware product as well. But most of my career has been or my career has been on software product management. So the product is about as well then what do they see when they sign in? What do they do uh, that that they have to use your product in order to fulfill a need? Um, and be like beyond that knowledge it's also, I guess, what happens on backstage is that you also need sometimes to project management to make it happen. So you probably need to say, you know what? I don't think this is going to be ready in two weeks. How do we cut the, the, the initial solution that we had designed? How do we cut it so that it actually can, something can be done within the next two weeks, which is project management. Also, another side of project management that you sometimes have to do is this UXer, I'm only having this UX for half of his time, when in reality I need a full-time UXer. So it's also about thinking about the resources that you have in order to hit your goals. So I think that marketing would be a flavor of product, but I think that there's more disciplines that need to come together in order to be a full product role. But I think I have seen enough transitions from project management into product, because if the project manager is really into, so what is it that we're trying to solve? It's not just focused on you know, organizing a plan, but trying to understand what is the underlying mission that they, they need to build. That's when they can transition into product, because they're going to know a lot about, like for example, there has been a project manager that works very well with the engineers, the engineers are going to nominate that person to become a product manager. So it's also like if you have handled projects that have required engineering and UX design and so on, even when you haven't done the product work in itself, this might be a path for you going in. But it's just, I think that you need to do, like you yourself need to do more um, investigation of what product means. And for that, I would suggest the Inspired, the Inspired book if you can. Can you speak a little bit louder, please? For someone who's been into product management, mm -hmm. like, um, a rookie product manager, is there like a uh, portfolio needed for job applications uh, when you send it out in your resume? You mean what boxes you need to yeah, tick? Yeah, what boxes you need to tick and is the portfolio required? Like, all right, I did this. Demo product. Yeah, I don't. 
I've, I've seen more portfolios. I guess that's more of the discipline. So the question was, is there a portfolio that you need to present when you're applying for a product role, right? Compared to a UX designer, who usually they have all of their demos into one very nice looking uh, website. I haven't done that myself. So most of what I rely on is storytelling. So how, do, how can I tell a story that mirrors what this job description says here? And then also, as well, I think that the, the, the brands that you work for sort of speak on your, on your behalf. Like, if you put a Trulia.com, the hiring manager can go and see actually like what you're talking about and gives, gives you some context of where you're coming from. Uh, I don't think it hurts, though. So like, if you're in a position to put together a bunch of demos of things that you work on, I would say find a way to share it uh, within your resume. Um, that that would be my only my only advice to share within your resume so it doesn't get lost. Does that help? Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah. yeah. <coughs> okay. Cool. Yes. I have a question about ways of working at Verve itself. At Verve? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I saw that you've got a culture of work where you want and where you want. And I'm curious the, to understand that apart from strong communication, how do you make that work? Because I work as a project manager, a product manager, um, and I've worked once with a team that isn't co-located, mm -hmm. and it's a struggle. Okay. I wouldn't say that's not the case for us. Uh, tools. So we invest on Zoom, which is, I think, the best voice conference like that, we, that I've ever used. And we know that we need to invest this as a business to make it. So it's not just about you having strong communication skills or not. It's also about the tools that enabled you to do so. We established norms for the use of um, Zoom. So for example, if a whole team, or if at least one person, and the teams actually set up their specific rules. So it's not like one rule fits everyone. Um, but if there's one person that is working remotely, why don't we just all go into Zoom because if there's one person signed up in a meeting room of five people and just one person working remotely, that person is going to get completely lost on the conversation. So no one's around that. We also have a real-time board renamed their brand to uh, Miro. Real-time board is basically a whiteboard that you can do all virtually. I don't know how expensive this is, but uh, it's been a lifesaver if you need to do some truth. You know, you go through some sort of design thinking process um, because you can, like, we can even do retrospectives through that because you can vote, uh, you can uh, add post its, and so on. I think, however, the most important thing, and, and then we have Slack, but Slack it's, Slack it's a good tool and Slack it's sort of evil because you need to establish some norms around that. Actually, Nir Al from, from Hooked, he has some good articles He's now focusing on like how to stay not distracted. So he has a good article on how Slack actually has norms on how they use Slack, uh, which is like, you know, not during week, week uh, weekends, not during like weeknights. Like they try to keep. Anyways, <laughs> I digress. So uh, back to the point. I think it's about having an open conversation about it with the with the teams. I think like it is what it is. Your company has decided to hire a remote team, maybe. You need to talk to them about like, guys, I have this frustration and so on, if there's that level of trust. Um, things that I have done in the past as well, which I had a team in, in Madrid when I was in Barcelona, I had to go every week um, for two days to Madrid. Granted that it was a two hour train. But, you know, I, I, and, and I always had to go with a UX designer, which actually helped me because I established a good relationship with UXer, and then, uh, if any, we com commiserated <laughs> together uh, when we had to take the train at 5 a.m. Um, but yeah, I think it's about opening up the conversation that if it's not working for you and you're a member of the team, uh, you need to bring it up in retrospective. That would be my suggestion. 